Welcome to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the weekly landscape update video I do in this garden in Raleigh, North Carolina, Zone 7B. Um, middle, early May here, and it's uh, 43 degrees this morning, which is kind of a little bit unusual here. Um, once we get into May, normally our, high, our lows are in the 50s. Uh, won't hurt the plants at all, but um, it is kind of a kind of a surprise to wake up to uh, after a couple 90 degree days last week. Uh, this area along the street uh, outside the fence has been um, one of the last areas really to get to, to have anything planted. Uh, it was during last year when things started happening out here. Uh, and this fence went in during the uh, toward the end of last summer. Uh, now things are coming back. Some perennial things that were planted out here are coming back. Uh, that includes milkweed and, and lots of natives, um, uh, native and, and some non-native uh, perennials are going out here. I need a couple shrubs out here and you guys will see that uh, in the next few weeks. One thing I want to point out here is this is probably the least prepared space in the landscape. The back garden got compost applied, had wood chips applied, um, went all out improving that soil. The coneflowers that have been planted in the back garden and the monarda, another native, um, but I'll show you in just a second, bee balm, planted in the backyard are less vigorous. Why would they be less vigorous? Um, it, it seems counterintuitive to think that you would prepare and prepare and prepare something and then them be less vigorous. These prairie plants, some of these native prairie plants like coneflowers uh, right here, actually kind of prefer just going in the ground and toughen it out a bit. They were, there was a little compost added to them when they were planted, but they definitely, th this cone flower here, which is already back up two and a half feet and is budded up, was six feet tall last year, if you guys, um, you guys have been following along with this channel. Whereas cone flowers in the back, are, you know, they flower, they do okay, but they're not anywhere near as vigorous as they are out here. I just wanna wanna point that out, that sometimes if you're, if you're, Failing on something that's native, sometimes it might be better just to try to stick it just in the soil, leave it up a bit, mulch it, keep the weeds away from it, but don't overdo the preparation. That's my point. Uh, here's another, co another cone flower coming back uh, very vigorously right there. Uh, here's a gara that's already, um, that's already flowering. Um, this is a, uh, um, a really nice uh, compact, a compact one. It will end up um, getting some size on it during the uh, summer, but uh, really compact uh, so far uh, this season. Here's this uh, bee bomb that I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> you can see how vigorous this is right out of the gate. I've got others uh, in more prepared space that are, you know, you know, a third, a third the size. Um, it's just interesting, or less even, that, than that one is. Again, examples of cone flowers uh, out here in the tougher spots. So this would be. We don't have a sidewalk here, um, so. Um, that little spot between the sidewalk and, and the road, we, we would call the hell strip. This is kind of our version of a hell strip between the fence and the road here. These tougher prairie native plants uh, may be a good call. Uh, the salvias here aren't native, but they're good, tough, tough plants to have out in a, in a section like this. This is a salvia nemorosa. These tend to be super early uh, flowering. Um, then this is May night salvia or salvia sylvestris. It's been blooming for a while. Then it kind of flops open. It allows some sunlight to come into the middle of it. New growth comes, it blooms a little more. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of these early flowering salvias. And then I have, I don't know how many are in the landscape, but we have, then have, have the ones that bloom all summer as well, uh, or, or bloom when it gets hotter. So they're, they're kind of staged uh, throughout the summer because they're the pollinator's absolute favorite. Again, more cone flowers um, that are just, you know, absolutely wildly uh, vigorous out here by the road. The Verbena bonariensis is kind of seems like it's happy anywhere as long as it's getting enough sun. It's already jumped out of the crown. Uh, I'm six feet tall, but I'm, I'm down on the ground here, but it's approaching five feet and in full bloom already here, May, whatever it is, sixth or seventh. Another super vigorous native uh, perennial that we can probably just leave the soil alone and, and let it roll is a uh, Joe pie weed. Uh, this one is up nearing five feet uh, out of the ground already. I've got a dwarf one in the back uh, garden called Little Joe, uh, but this is the uh, standard uh, native uh, Joe pie weed. This is the, one of the best plants for pollinators. You gotta send them home at one o'clock. You gotta give them last call and tell them they gotta get out of the yard and, and go home for the night. Uh, they love this one so much. 
one other salvia nemorosa here in full flower. Uh, once those uh, once those flowers fade um, in a in a couple weeks, uh, they can be cut, and they'll, again they'll put on new growth and bloom a little more. They won't quite be peak bloom again, but they'll continue to bloom. You know, uh, they'll have flowers on them during the summertime. I have a uh, one spirea uh, in the entire landscape. It's a dwarf spirea, and it is starting to. Uh, to flower right now and it's absolutely covered uh, in buds. This little pink, this little light pink uh, looks fantastic in here with a lot of dark green foliage and the purples and light pinks of the annuals that surround it. Here's that little Joe, uh, Joe pie weed. Here's basically a more, a more compact version of our native uh, Joe pie weed, but you, this is its second season coming up and it's just gonna be absolutely full of flowers by summer. I said in last week's video, I'd go through some of the hosta. Uh, that are in the uh, landscape. Uh, this one is called Blue Ivory, and you can see it's a standout. Um, you know, see this thing from the moon, I think. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. This is the third season it's coming back up, and I like to buy hosta in little teeny tiny containers just to try to save some money on them. Some of the latest and the greatest are, they're not inexpensive, um, so the smaller the container, the better, because they're super easy. Now, if you, if you have deer issues, um, you know, hosta are probably not for you. I do have uh, rhodias. Uh, several rhodia in the landscape. Um, maybe that'll be something uh, we'll talk about at some point after this one goes in the ground, but rhodia are good if you have deer issues. These are like, uh, they're similar, somewhat similar to hosta, but they're evergreen. Uh, they're not, there's not a rhodia that's that showy, uh, but they are fantastic plants. This is, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about those uh, at some point uh, as, as alternatives for those of you with deer issues. This is varieties called Island Breeze. I just bought a couple of these really beautiful, really beautiful stand out here. Um, there's a couple of them going along this back line. So let's see some more. Here's another variety called Dream Queen, uh, which is going uh, in now with the uh, nice yellow center variegation. It should look great with this uh, little honey uh, oak leaf hydrangea. In between a hydrangea and some hyacinths that have uh, bloomed out, uh, is one called Dancing Queen, and uh, I really like that gold foliage. I can tell this one's going to be very vigorous. It's only, it w went in last year as a little court, and uh, now it, in waking up the first year, it's already this size, so it's definitely going to be a vigorous one. These hyacinths will eventually die back to the ground. Uh, the hydrangea is about to start flowering, so it'll have blue flowers on it with that gold foliage. That should look great. This variety is called Hans and it has multiple variegations in it. I really, really like this one. Got a little bit of slug damage on it. I'm hoping the birds will uh, help me out uh, with this, this little issue. Hopefully it's just one or two uh, slugs over here and not an army, army of them, but this one, uh, I really, really like it. One other thing directly in front of it that I want to point out real quick. Somebody asked me if my hardy begonias uh, had survived the uh, winter, and there's the first sign of one coming up. I have another group of them in the front garden I haven't seen yet, but you can see here we are. It's actually May 9th. I said it was like 5th or 6th earlier, but uh, there's the hardy begonias coming back. This one's called Liberty. I really like it. Um, this is a great example of why everything in your garden needs to be labeled. Uh, while it was asleep, uh, this Lakotha we got planted on its head, so uh, Liberty will be uh, transferring uh, to a new location uh, in the garden, but uh, this is, you know, uh, th this can happen. Uh, while, while plants are asleep for sure, but uh, this is a beautiful variegation. This is one of my favorites. Uh, it's called guacamole. has the dark green uh, edge on it and a slightly lighter green uh, center that's kind of a guacamole color. Um, really like, I really like that one a lot. And this is another one that's going in uh, this week called Great Expectations. And this will be in a shade plant uh, video, a shade perennial video uh, when some of these other hosta go in. One of the more interesting ones in the landscape is called Curly Fries. Uh, really, really interesting um, plant. If you didn't know this was a hosta, you might, you might, um, you might not guess that, honestly. Um, this uh, one right here is an award-winning one, and you can, you can see why. Look at this incredible, absolutely incredible variegation in this one. It's called Rainbow's End. Again, it was planted from a small court uh, pot last year, so they're coming back in their first season uh, from being dormant. They're, they're smaller growing, smaller growing varieties for sure. I've got another one uh, that's going in the ground, not actually right here, but I just brought it over here. This one's called Cool as a Cucumber. You can see the narrow, super narrow leaf on that one. And then this one's called June. So it's been around for a while and it's, uh, you know, what, what a great, what a great variegation that is. Just a perfect leaf on it. 
Hi, you don't really see me much, but I'm Stephanie, and I just wanted to talk to you about a couple types of plants that are really important to me in the landscape. Um, I think of them as um, heritage plants or heirloom plants. Um, this right here um, is from my dad. My dad's deceased now, but I like to, um, when he did pass, I got a few of his plants, and some of them aren't with me anymore, but this one is, and it's just your standard royal standard hosta, and I love to come and see it, and it makes me think of my dad, um, and that's super important. Another thing from his, him is the bluebird house that you guys see in the videos as well. This hosta here was rescued from out in the front when the maple came down and exposed that whole area to full sun. Um, there were a bunch of hostas that had to be re relocated, and they're You'll find them hidden in different special spots in the, the landscape, but they're sort of um, heritage plants or heirloom plants for the house itself. Uh, and we have them in different areas. Do you have some special plants that you love in your landscape, be they from your parents or your siblings or just special things that you have in yours? Just put them below so you can share. I'll finish this video up with some Elysium. Uh, somebody uh, commented down below last week's video and wondered if I had any Elysium. There are four in the landscape. Uh, Elysium are native to the southeast and down into Mexico. We have our straight uh, native Elysium and then there's combos uh, as well. This variety is called Grey Ghost. There's a really interesting variegation on it. White flowers. I showed it in flowers, a flower a few weeks back. Uh, let's jump to the three others. As always, I have to have a gold one. Uh, this is a uh, Florida Sunshine Elysium. It's been shown on the channel many, many times. Uh, but this is a this is just a great this is just a great plant. This one's in part shade, uh, definitely not as tolerant uh, of the full sun as the others. It's shedding a few leaves right now, which is pretty typical of evergreen plants as they're putting on new growth. They'll shed some of the uh, old foliage. If I just take a few steps this way, this is our native uh, Elysium uh, to the southeast. Um, right here. This is a Elysium floridanum. Uh, again, they bloom in, in, interesting time, early, early, early uh, in the season. And they have this neat looking star shaped uh, flower on them. Uh, deer don't go anywhere near them, which is good for those of you uh, with deer issues. And lastly, what has probably become my favorite is this Miss Scarlet Elysium. I've got this one planted next to this fence, so it'll eventually be a, a screening plant here. Uh, this one is super interesting because it wears its flowers on the outside. Some of the other Elysium varieties kind of eat their flowers, so to speak. The flowers are on the older growth inside the plant, and it's not quite that showy. This one, just the flowers are right on the outside of it, and they're like a scarlet red. That's why it's called Miss Scarlet. Again, yellow, few yellow leaves on it right now because it's the time of year when they do some shedding. So thank you guys for following along with these weekly updates. And like uh, Stephanie said, uh, comment down below if there's something in your landscape that is, has sentimental value in some way. Thanks for watching.